Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm really grateful to be here with you guys today. I've uh, spent three and a half hours on the phone with the IRS this morning. So we'll see what spiritual, what, how, how empty the spiritual tank is today. Um, I did pause and pray, but um, I'm really excited to talk about this step. Uh, first of all, let me just say that I have a home group. It's the Hopeful Agnostics Big Book Meeting. We meet on Thursday nights at six o'clock um, in Marble Falls, Texas. If you're ever in our area, come see us. Um, and I have a sponsor and I sponsor. And, and I think that's amazing. I think it's amazing to be so well connected. And I'm excited to be talking about the fifth step. There's, I don't believe in my experience that there is another step that is so direct an action in the opposite direction of my alcoholism as the fifth step. The big book uses words in reference to our recovery like conquer. And I love that word. And there's nothing that so much conquers my untreated alcoholism as this process of the fifth step. And um, my disease has told me forever. My alcoholism tells me forever that I'm different, keep it a secret, don't let them know, right? Um, if people really knew what you felt, how you felt, or if they really knew what you thought, right? They think you were crazy, whatever it is. Um, and people do think I'm crazy, but not like that. Um, and But when I sit down across the table from another alcoholic and I become transparent through the process of sharing my inventory, I blow all of that up. All of the lies that my disease has told me go away. And for me, the first time I did a fifth step, I felt like I really claimed my chair in Alcoholics Anonymous, like I had really done something concrete um, that allowed me to be a member in good standing of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I still feel that way when I get done with inventory work and I get on um, with my, get to meet with my sponsor and go over that inventory, which I just did some of that Monday evening. Um, I walk away from that feeling very committed to my recovery um, and very grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous that I don't have to stay stuck because I was so stuck <laughs> before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. So um, the big book has some really good clear cut instructions and I um, am going to go through those and kind of try and share my experience. I don't I think we need teachers and Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know that that's ever been very effective with people who suffer from untreated alcoholism. So I, I'm not interested in teaching, but but you guys sharing with me has always allowed me to stay. And you guys sharing your experience, strength, and hope with me has always afforded me a place in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I hope that's what I'll be able to do today is share my experience, strength, and hope with some of what this text says. and. Well, I think it's so important. So um, I am on page 72 in the big book, and um, we've just finished our inventory process through the fourth step. We've looked at resentments and fears and harms caused and sex conduct. And um, now we're, <clears throat> we're going to start out on this next step. And it says, which I thought, quite honestly, it was enough to make the inventory. The idea that I needed to share it with someone seemed very offensive to me, um, but so be it. Um, having just made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We have been trying to get a new, so there's, there's three things that we're trying to do here right off the bat. I'm trying to get a new attitude. I needed to change mind, right? I needed a different perspective. So I'm trying to get a new attitude. The second thing is a new relationship with a creator. Any relationship would have been an improvement. Um, but even today, when I do the inventory, I end up in a new relationship with a power greater than myself as I understand him. Um, and then to discover the obstacles in my path. Why am I disturbed? What is causing me to be separated from this power? Um, we have admitted certain defects. We've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We've put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. Now these are about to be cast out. We should be so lucky. That's a bit of a misnomer. <laughs> now these are about to be exposed. 
Um, but I got to tell you, I've been doing inventory for a long time and I still got pride and judgment. It hasn't been cast out. Um, it's still there. So this requires action on our part, which when completed will mean, right, that I've admitted to God, to myself, and to another human being the exact nature of my defects. And this brings us to the fifth step in the program of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. It's perhaps difficult discussing our defects with another person. You think? <laughs> Seriously, it is not perhaps difficult. It is excruciating. And the only reason, let me just say this also before we get into this. The only reason that I'm going to be willing to take this awful, terrible, no good, very bad action, that's how I feel about it before I do it, right? Before I take my first fifth step, I'm looking at this step thinking, you have got to be kidding me. There is no way I'm telling somebody all that. No way. And the only reason that I'm willing to do that is that I have become convinced that I have a fatal illness that is rooted not in drinking, but in self. And it tells me in step three that there's no way of entirely getting rid of self without God's help. And so as I understand it, the inventory is going to expose the things that separate me from that power. And the, pro the remaining process of the steps is going to allow me to get connected to that power. And if I'm connected to that power, right, then I don't have to die of this fatal illness. If I can't get connected to that power, if I continue to allow the things that are blocking me to be blocking me, then the book assures me that what is on the other side of that is death, right? Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Right. And I will tell you, my experience is that the sometimes slowly has motivated me a number of times in my sobriety. There were days in my early recovery where if you had said, if you take a drink, you're going to die. If you could have guaranteed me that I might have taken a drink because I really didn't like not drinking. <laughs> I am not a fan of not, I wasn't a fan of not drinking before I worked the steps. I was so uncomfortable just not drinking. So if you could have said to me, you take four drinks, you're out of here. There were days where four drinks and I'm out of here would have been okay. But the truth is I saw people that had been sober, that had gone back out, that just couldn't get back and just couldn't die. And I don't want to, I don't want that. And I, I became willing to take actions I, I didn't believe in and I didn't think they would work and I didn't want to do them because sometimes slowly, right? So um, we usually, the, 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 there's a sentence in that paragraph that says, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. And my friend Trina says it better than anybody. She says, that's because I always agree with myself. And I do. If I have a plan and I run it by me, I think it's brilliant. If you've stepped on my toes and I have a resentment, I agree with my assessment of how wrong your behavior is a thousand percent of the time. I don't have another perspective. I'm not looking at it from an entirely different angle. I just know you're wrong. And we just burn the bridge and move on. And that's how I live my life. So it says we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient because self cannot expose self. Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. We'll be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should do so. The best reason first. This is pretty, this is a pretty powerful sentence. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. The definition of vital is necessary to life. That implies that in order for me to live free, the step is necessary. Like I can't get there without the fifth step. All right. Um, time after time, newcomers have tried to keep stuff to themselves. Absolutely, we do. We all do that. Because why would I tell you all that, right? Um, trying to avoid the humbling experience, they've turned to easier methods. And then it says another warning. This chapter is so full of warnings. Another warning. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Invariably, without fail. And I will, I don't think you can see it, but... And if I pick my book up, it'll fall apart. But next to this, next, next to the next, in my margin of my book, next to what I'm about to read, I have a list of names. Wayne Barron, Daddy, 
Wade, John, Bernie, Woody, and Diane. They just kept a little something to themselves. They just weren't willing to be entirely honest with another human being. And I buried every one of them. Right? And I can see why they couldn't stay in these next few sentences. They never completed their housekeeping. They only thought they had lost their egoism and fear. They only thought they had humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. So it's not necessarily necessary for everyone. But in the sense that the suffering alcoholic who's trying to recover from a fatal illness finds it necessary, we have to have humility, fearlessness, and honesty. Those are requirements in order for me to recover. Maybe not everybody. If you don't have alcoholism, okay. Maybe you don't have to be humble and fearless and honest all the time. Maybe you can get away with some stuff. My life depends on me having ego deflation at depth. My life depends on my willingness to become transparent. That's what this paragraph is telling us. And that anything that I reserve, anything that I'm unwilling to be transparent about, right, jeopardizes my ability to survive. More than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. I don't know. Yeah, but we for sure do. Very much the actor. To the outer world, he presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. Isn't it the truth? I go out, maybe for a day or two, I'm able to pull it off. And it really begins to look like to the people around me that I'm starting to get it together. But I will pull a structure down on my head every single time because I know the truth. Right? I know I'm a fraud. I know I'm a liar. I know it's all just a house of mirrors, right? The inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his spree. Coming to his senses, he is revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. Um, okay, I'm going to go down to the bottom of page 73. It says, We must, this is a pretty clear cut direction, we must be entirely honest with somebody. If we expect to live long or happily in this world. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't connect happy and honest <laughs> before I got here, right? Um, I must be entirely honest with somebody. If I want to be able to stay free from the next drink, if I want to stay, be able to stay free from the bondage of self, if I want to be able to be present, Right. And happily. And it tells us later on that happily is contingent on usefulness. My my ability to really be happy as a sober member of AA is contingent on my ability to be useful in Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. And so how am I going to be useful when you ask me for help if I haven't taken the actions that are required to recover? Right. Um, rightly and naturally, we think well before we choose this person or persons. Okay, pause on the text for a minute. Um, here's the deal. I did a fifth step with my first sponsor. And my fifth step beat me back to my home group. And when I went to the meeting that night at 530, everyone was discussing the things that I had shared with her. And I know that sounds awful. And I know you just think, oh, my God, that must have been horrible. But there was this old timer who I adored. His name was Gerald. And he pulled me into this little room at the club. And he said, that's a reflection on her, not on you. Don't let her have your recovery. And it was just enough to tap my pride. Right. And I thought, that's right. <laughs> that's right. You're an asshole. Right. Um, Shame on you. And so I stayed. I didn't let it run me out. I don't recommend it. But I will tell you that as a result of her behavior, two things. One, I didn't have anything to hide. My home group already knew it all, right? So the facade was gone. 
because they were all talking about it. Oh God, can y'all hear that? Can you hear it? Okay. If you can hear it and it's awful, I'll stick my head outside. They're mowing. The guys just showed up to mow naturally right outside my office. Unbelievable. If it gets to be too much, somebody shoot me a message in the chat. I'll stick my head out and tell them to stop. Um, so one, I didn't have to play anymore because everybody already knew all my secrets because she had shared them. And two, guess who didn't stay sober? Not me. She did not stay sober. And she spent the next 18 years trying to get back. And the truth is, it was horrible to watch. I didn't wish that on her, right? I was not delighted that she drank. And it was awful to watch her suffer. But I was clear. It was another example, right, of the reason they talk to us about living by a set of principles is because it matters that we live by a set of principles. And when we set aside those principles, right, we become so uncomfortable, we can't stand it anymore. And it becomes necessary to um, wet it down, right? So I know the book emphasizes confidence and confidentiality and finding somebody to listen to your fifth step that you 100% trust, okay? And I'm not knocking that. What I am saying is that my experience is the telling for me is more important than who's listening. It is more important for me to get it done than it is for me to find the exact perfect person that can hear my fifth step. I've seen a lot of people get really nuts over the years holding on to their fourth step because they just got to find the exact right person to listen to their fifth step. No, you don't, <laughs> right? You can find the exact wrong person to listen to your fifth step and it turns out you can stay sober anyway. I do get why they're saying it. And I will tell you that for me, when I listen to a fifth step, one of the things I learned from that experience is when I listen to a fifth step before I listen, and my sponsees all know this, I ask God to help me forget it as soon as I hear it. Because I don't want to walk around with your stuff in my head, quite frankly. Um, and gossip has been one of my defects of character. I don't want to have the information to accidentally share. So I ask God to protect me from that, right? Because I know me. You know, and so I don't, I don't share in a way that is unacceptable. Now, if I sponsor you and you call and you've got some specific situation that you're walking through, and I know somebody that's been through that specific situation, I'll tell you, I'd like to call so-and-so and see if it's okay if you talk to that person, right? That's cool. We're all, all having a conversation about it. Um, but I, as much as they stress the confidentiality in the book, I don't think it, for me, my experience, this is just my experience. My experience is the people, the old timers in my life did not allow that, allow me to use that as an excuse not to stay with you. Right. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and that next, it's so funny. Um, where it talks about, you know, we might want to share this with a wife or a husband or a what? No, I don't want my family to hear any of this. I would burn every inventory ever written before I'd let my mother get her hands on any of it. You know what I mean? Like, no, or my kids. God. Uh, we cannot disclose anything to wives or parents, which will hurt them and make them unhappy. The next sentence is such good direction. We have no right to save our own skin at another person's expense. I don't know why they stuck that in the middle of that paragraph and buried it right there, but man, that's good information. Such parts of our story we tell to someone who will understand yet be unaffected. The rule is a rule. You know, you hear people who say there's no rules in AA. Apparently there's rules in AA. The rule is we must be hard on ourselves, but always considerate of others. That's what it says. Right? Anybody had any success being always considerate of others? Me either. Um, right? It's a goal. <laughs> Notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing ourselves with someone, it may be that we are so situated there's no suitable person available. Can I just tell you that in 2023, that's garbage. When they wrote the book in 1939, I believe that that was a real thing. And there were people where there really wasn't somebody who was um suitable right i can tell you that in 2023 you just need somebody to listen 
Um, so, I'm sorry. Please. Oh, which line? It says, uh, notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing ourselves with someone, it may be one is so situated that there is no suitable person available. Especially in this age of Zoom. It just, now, I believe when they put it in there that that was valid for sure in 1939. I'm not saying it wasn't. Absolutely. I think it was today. It's an excuse. Right to avoid the to to avoid becoming transparent. Thank you. Um, at the top of page seventy five, it says, "When we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time." Now listen, and I think this is really important. It's a little bit about step four, but it also relates to this. This is for me. It's a pet peeve of mine, and and unfortunately, I've seen it a lot, and it and so now I may sound a little preachy. So let me just apologize ahead of time for what I'm, if I'm going to sound preachy here, but to me, there is nothing less acceptable in Alcoholics Anonymous than agreeing to sponsor someone, getting them started on step four and not being immediately available for a fifth step. When I do my first inventory in particular, I have dug up some of the most excruciating things that I've lived through. I'm looking at my defects in a way I've never looked at them before. I am uncomfortable in a way that I have never been uncomfortable before. I am aware of myself and the harms that I've caused, right? I feel tremendous. Usually I feel tremendous shame or remorse about my conduct, right? To leave someone in that space unattended is cruel. And if you are new and you're going through your fourth step and you're about to come up to your fifth step or you've completed your fourth step and you're going to do your fifth, if you have someone that's helping you that's not available, screw them. Go find somebody else. To sit on that inventory is fatal. We will not survive that. People like us do not survive that time. Right. It is critical to keep moving through the steps. Don't pause. Right. Don't write inventory until you get thirsty. Right. That's not the point. Right. Once you've written the inventory, keep moving. Um, sorry, I think the sermon is over. Um, we are we when we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time. We have a written inventory and we are prepared for a long talk. Um, we explain to our partner what we're about to do. Although if you're working with a sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous, the sponsor should be fully aware of what's happening. Um, should realize that we're engaged upon a life and death errand, right? This is my life. It's not some flippant thing. When I, when I went through the steps the second time with my, with a different sponsor, this woman, her name was Rosemary Berry. Rose had this beautiful home and she was beautiful and clean, right? And her home was quiet. She had asked her family to give us the afternoon because it was important. And her family gave us the afternoon because they knew how important it was, right? And so I went into this, I drug my bag of shame and guilt and defects and bad behavior and poor judgment into her house feeling like awful and yeah, awful is a good word. And um, I sat across the table from her and, and the thing that happens for me, and I think it's the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think Alcoholics Anonymous, it's, it's Alcoholics Anonymous in its purest form. What happens is I tell you something. Right. I share I'm resentful because blah, 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 blah. This is what's happened. I get over to that fourth column. And it's like, what have I done? How have I responded to this resentment? Right. And I and I'm seeing for the first time, maybe how I've responded to this resentment and what the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous is that the person I'm talking to nods. Right. And if I take a breath, they say, oh, me too. And that allows me to stay and to read the next one. Right. And then she's nodding 
It's what happens when we share in meetings. I share my experience, strength, and hope with you. I talk about my, my history or my drinking or things that I've done, stupid things that I've done in my sobriety, and you guys laugh and you nod and you say me too. And it allows me to keep my chair. Right. And so that's what happened for me in that in that fifth step is that she sat across the table for me in her beautiful house with her beautiful clothes and her hair done in this beautiful room. Right. And she said, oh, honey, me too. And then she shared with me some of her story, which allowed me to share more of mine. Right. In the middle of page 75 is one of my most favorite paragraphs in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it is the fifth step promises. There are eight promises here. Um, I think they're incredibly powerful. I, before we read them, I just want to sort of paint a picture. For me, I was eaten alive with resentment and fear, although I hadn't been able to really clearly identify the fear. But I, man, I was angry. Oh, I was so angry. I just vibrated with it. I had no connection with anybody on the planet. I was just consumed with self, right? And I know for a fact that Alcoholics Anonymous can't help me. So I got that going for me. Got a big old chip on my shoulder, right? Got a really defiant attitude about anything that you ask me to do or tell me to do. And I'm broken, right? Because what I believed prior to this fifth step was that I was damaged goods. I just believed there was something wrong with me, something bad wrong with me, right? And um, I, while what you had looked attractive, sort of, I didn't like all the prayer and holding hands and stuff, but what, what you had looked attractive, I just didn't believe it was available for me. And that's where I, that's the place that I was in when I showed up for that fifth step. And then this happened. I pocketed my pride and I went to it, illuminating every twist of character and every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step, withholding nothing, now there's the condition. All the promises in the book have a condition attached to them, and that's the condition, withholding nothing. So I can't go into this fifth step and give you half and come out with the promises, right? I go into this fifth step withholding nothing. We are delighted. I didn't even know I wanted to be delighted, right? <clears throat> I can look the world in the eye. I, I've been staring at my shoes for a long time, right? I do this fifth step. I can just look the world in the eye. My head's up. <clears throat> we can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Now, I will tell you, it says we can be alone at perfect peace and ease. It doesn't say we will, right? Um, I had the capacity to be alone at perfect peace and ease. I, I have not always been since I did my first fifth step, obviously. But when I'm finished with that fifth step, I have the capacity to be alone at perfect peace and ease. Right. Um, our fears fall from us. That happened to me in a big way because I had been so afraid of people knowing who I really was. Uh, we begin, not all at once, but we begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. One of the things that Rose did for me and one of the things that I just really value when I'm visiting with my sponsees is to be able to point out where God is. Because when I'm in the bondage of self, I can't see God, right? I need you to show me where he is. And that's one of the valuable things about that fifth step is that I can, we can listen to each other, share their, our stories, and then we can say, can you believe you survived that? God must really want you to be sober. We can say, can you see how God was present through all of that chaos and allowed you to make it to Alcoholics Anonymous, right? We can, we can begin to have a sense that there is a creator who genuinely cares for us, right? Um, 
we may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience for sure. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. I will tell you, and I shared it earlier, when I finished that fifth step, the feeling that the drink problem had been removed was for sure real for me. Right? I felt like a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Right? I believed, I believed for the first time that maybe the program of Alcoholics Anonymous could help me. Right? And my alcoholism was quiet. That's a result of the fifth step. Every time I do a fifth step, and I love that, right? My disease is just shut up. It doesn't have anything to say because I just exposed all the lies, right? Shine some light on. And then the end of the fifth step process, it tells us that we return home where we can find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. I don't think that it was a mistake that they put an hour. I don't think they meant 10 minutes. I don't think they meant three hours, right? I think that if I'm compliant and I want the results that are promised to me in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's an hour, right? I'm home, I'm quiet, I'm reviewing the work that I've done so far for an hour. Carefully, yeah, whoops, we thank God for that. Here's another direction. I'm just not sitting thinking about myself. I review the work that I've done. And then I thank God from the bottom of my heart that I know him better, whether I feel like I know him better or not. I just say, thank you. Taking this book down from our shelf. I will tell you that the first time I did my fifth step, I literally put the book on a shelf and took the book off a shelf because I was terrified. <laughs> and I was desperate for some relief. Put the book on the shelf, took the book off the shelf. Um, taking this book off the shelf, we turn to the page, which contains the 12 steps, carefully reading the first five proposals. We ask if we have omitted anything. So I will, let me tell you how that worked for me. Where, where am I on time? Okay, I'm about done. How that worked for me is that when I started to review the first five proposals, I was convinced of the first proposal and the second proposal more than ever when I was done with the fifth step. I was more convinced that I was alcoholic. I had a much clearer picture of how unmanageable my life was. And it was obvious to me that I needed to be restored to sanity in a way that was not clear to me before I had done that fifth step, right? And so I had a new perception of step one and step two as a result of step five. I had a new willingness to put three into place as a result of step five. Right? There was a more of a sense of, oh, God, please help me, because I'm looking at pages of evidence of how I burn it to the ground. I just burn it to the ground every time, right? And I don't want to. If I did want to continue to burn it to the ground, you can bet I wouldn't have written that inventory and showed up at her house. Right? Still true today. When I'm committed to the chaos, you can bet I'm just committed to the chaos. I'll get to the inventory when I get to it. You know what I mean? I'm less willing to make amends today than I have ever been. So I try not to be committed to the chaos, but um, I just don't like amends. That's the truth. Um, I review these proposals. And then we ask ourselves, did I leave anything out? There have been three inventories that I've done in my sobriety where I've had to go back, where I was sitting for an hour and I was reviewing and I thought, did I leave anything out? And the answer to that question was yes. And I had to call the sponsor and I had to say, I forgot to tell you about this, right? Um, why does this even matter? <laughs> Tells us we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man. It refers to the keystone. It refers to the foundation stone, right? We're, we're building an arch through which we shall walk a free man or woman or whatever. Um, it, then there's four questions. Is the work that I've done through this process solid? Right? Do I have any lingering notions? Is there something God can't have? Am I unwilling to look at anything where my behavior is concerned? 
have uh, are the stones properly in place? Bill Wilson was such a visual and could do. Are the stones properly in place, right? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? Um, mortar without sand dries out and doesn't hold, right? And so what they're saying is, you know, we have this opportunity to pause here. We're in the process of one through five, and we have this opportunity to pause and say, did I miss anything, right? Uh, before I go forward. So for me, four and five is um, really an inward look. God is present. A sponsor maybe is present or some confidant is present. present. Um, but this is really an inward look at myself. This is really me saying, wow, way to go. <laughs> Look at the chaos and disorder you've created, genius, right? And here's the here's the pattern of defects that I continue to repeat, the pattern of behaviors as a manifestation of self that I continue to repeat. And I pause after the fifth step and I look and say, you know, is there anything I left out? Is there anything else I need to do? And when I do that, sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. Um, but I can, I can call the sponsor back and say, you know, I forgot to tell you this. Or I can, and sometimes for me today, I do a four step, I do the fifth step. And a couple of days later, something the sponsor has said will start to kind of sink in, right? And I'll pick up the pen and paper again and re-inventory because I have some new information and I can look at it from a different way. Um, I think the the principle behind the fifth step for me, I know a lot of people say um, it's courage. Um, for me, the principle behind the fifth step is transparency. Um, transparency is recovery. If I can be transparent, I'm recovered. If I cannot be transparent, there's still some some area of my life that I'm trying to put a shine on it or I'm trying to make sure you don't know or Right. If there's something my sponsor used to say all the time that his life was an open book. And the first time that I heard him say it, I thought, that's because you're old. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, I just was like, well, yeah, I was 29 when he started sponsoring me. And I was like, I've been sober 12 years. There was a lot of chaos in there and a lot more to come. And I thought if I was about to die, I'd probably be transparent, too. Right. I just judged it. And. um but as he continued to work with me for the next 22 years, what I got to see is that his life was an open book. And, and that is when I'm willing to live that way, when this step is active in my two square feet and I'm willing to be transparent, I'm free. I'm super free. And more importantly, right, I'm not thirsty. My alcoholism has no power in my life. Right. If I screw it up, if I shank it off into the woods, I'll just tell you there's people on this meeting right now that know that's a fact. I'll just tell you like, oh, my God, I got it so wrong. Y'all aren't even going to believe what I did. Right. And then I tell you what I did and you go, oh, my God, I did that last week. <laughs> right. Because we're all pretty much the same. And that's the other thing that happens in the, the fist listening to repeated fist repeated listening to. What's the word that I'm trying to find? A number of fifth steps over the years from different w women that I've worked with. What I what I know now that I didn't know then is that we're all exactly the same. All of that noise in my head for all of my life that was like, you're not cute enough. You're not funny enough. She's smarter than you. She has more money than you. She's more career than you, she's more blah, 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 all that garbage is garbage, right? When we get through that process of the inventory, what I understand is that you have selfishness and self-centeredness, you have pride, you have judgment, you have dishonesty, you have fears, you have right all of these same defects that I have. Now, maybe yours look different, right? I sponsor people that don't like confrontation. I really love confrontation. 
right? Um, but it's the same defect that drives it. It's fear either way, no matter how it manifests, right? And so by being available to sponsor and listen to fifth steps, right? All of those differences start to be smashed. And then it just becomes like we're just one, you know, we're just one drunk, right? Who's just, it's just alcoholism. And whatever else there is, the alcoholism keeps us the same, right? The alcoholism is the great equalizer. So I think that's all I have for today. I appreciate everybody listening and everybody being here. It's good to see some familiar faces. Thank you.